welcome to this session which is going to be special for a lot of reasons i at least hope so and hope the same vibe is uh, carried forward to you as well so when i set out to um, what do you say teach on this platform in 2017 and the founder and ceo dr deep who was my senior in mbbs and pg who studied in the same college mbbs and same college pg his vision was essentially to to give the most scientific knowledge to students across the country in this very vast subject called medicine and most importantly to to make the student feel worthy of the fact that he has joined this course because this course is a very very special course it's a course that has got a lot of meaning lot of lot of uh, what do you say depth as far as understanding is concerned and so in so many other ways it's a very special course so the exams those days i'm saying in 2017 were not expecting you to know things ex exactly how it is being learned in the hospital so hospital based learning was a different thing entrance exam was a totally different thing there were two parallel things in 2016 2017 because the entrance exam would ask you interleukin 1 is released from tnf alpha is involved with those were the questions you used to get in the entrance but in hospital setting what to used to do were totally different so that was how the exam was that's why when we look into this history of the exam this is something that all of us need to be knowing from 2012 the exam was conducted by the nad board so till 2011 that was the last of the exams i wrote the exam in 2011 that was an exam which was conducted by aims so till then it was aims and the exam was full on clinical so that's why we have all studied with a clinical angle because that was the only way we could crack the exam then but 2012 the exam was handed over to the nad board and nad board for 3 4 years conducted exams which were just like centered on one liners one liners one liners because very simple very easy questions which you have to mug up from the guide or you have to go to the class get set up notes study the notes and then you go and write the exam so although we talk about clinical medicine this way that way that case came up like this this way this case came up like that the student always had a feeling that this is something that i have to study as a post graduate undergraduate times to crack the entrance this is something that i have to be studying and hospital is something that is totally different so that's how things were it is at that point in time that deepu sabin came up with this whole idea of maro but he was so uh, courageous i would say and he was somebody who had that vision that learning had to be transformed because this is not a style of learning it's not like you can forget the fact that you are a doctor and just sit and study something like a 12th standard student and become a post graduate so right from the beginning even during those times he wanted a very much clinically centered approach and that is what we have been trying also but fortunately what happened is in 2017 they had lot of complaints from different corners in the country that this pattern of exam was heading nowhere and so they started making the exam a bit more difficult so the difficulty level of the exam in 2017 was of a much higher order than 2016 and from 2017 onwards the exam started getting really difficult getting difficult is not exactly equal to becoming clinical because clinical questions sometimes may be more easier than the so called fact based questions but the exam was getting difficult and as it went to 2019 and 2020 it got really difficult and we had lot of clinical questions in 2019 and 2020 so at the end of the 2020 exam uh, we had this news in jan 2020 that now the whole exam is going to become next and it is going to be along this mrcp usmle line and we have to take the clinical discussion to the next level that is how the discussions are going to be and we were prepping ourselves for that but it's in the midst of that that the bomb called covid actually came in and we didn't have exams for a long period of time for almost 20 months we did not have any exam in the country and almost two batches were stuck in the middle of that another three batches were doing mbbs were also stuck in the middle of that so we were continuously discussing things we were giving clinical discussions etc but those were just to help the students study during their mbbs times but after this when the nad board came up with the exam uh, after this gap or hiatus they made the exam very easy it was again a very very easy paper with few 25 30 tough questions they reduced the number of questions from 300 to 200 which made it even more easier and of which around 130 140 were very simple fact based questions you can see in the recall sessions that we have done 2021 exam was also similar kind 2022 22 exam and 23 exam so we had three set exams all the three were similar kind which again doesn't require you to have very much full blown knowledge clinical knowledge you can manage but you need to answer the tough questions otherwise to break the bar and get a higher rank is not possible but now again we are in a bit of a soup we are in a bit of a soup because next is something that is knocking at the doors we really know that next is going to happen majority of the students doing their mbbs now are going to be confronting next and even if you don't clear for the others then you may have to be writing next and next is a completely clinical exam it's a full on clinical exam with 90% of the questions being clinical and 10% of the questions being factual like how we have for the mrcp exam so it is more or less going to be centered around mrcp so people who are preparing for mrcp or usmd right from mbbs they may have got some exposure to questions like this but for the others they have literally got zero exposure so this 
attempt of mine, okay, this attempt of mine or this attempt of our team is essentially towards sensitizing you to a clinical question, which is such a welcoming thing. So many people are afraid of next time just waiting for that to happen because that will really boost the doctor inside us. Till then, we are going to be in a very primitive naive stage who really doesn't think that you are a doctor by profession. You're thinking of yourself again at that 12th standard level, getting some notes, writing the notes, studying the notes and thinking that everything else will happen later on. Nothing will happen later on. We have to make things happen. There is no other way. Nobody's going to make anything happen for us at any point in time during our career. It is we who have to make things happen. So when the exam is along these lines, and that is at least going to be some kind of a motivation, some impetus to drive forward. To know that, okay, now me being a doctor and attempting the exam, both are pretty much parallel. Both are pretty much in sync. Which means on one side, I'm studying by seeing patients. On the other side, I'm watching video and again studying clinical. Everything is going to help me to cater to this exam. Because this exam is going to be, as we have, uh, we think, 100%, 90 to 100% clinical. And we are not going to have any kind of these uh, so-called mug-up style questions which take a lot of our time so that means that the discussions also have to be along those lines so this is the first of its kind kind of a discussion which we will try to uh what do you say engage you i'll try to engage you in that discussion and try to think of cases that actually come to us or we see on a day-to-day -day basis and how these questions can be put up for the exam how we can do open-ended discussions and through that how we integrate a lot of the chapters and uh, what do you say? Essentially, we we fall into the group and we start enjoying this whole process. From where is TNF Alpha produced is a question which nobody can enjoy and learn. We learn that primarily because we are attempting the exam, nothing else. But clinical based medicine is what we learn uh, and we get the feeling that, okay, I am doing something which I like, which is something that we generally attribute to skill based people. No? Uh, an actor is doing something that he likes, a cricketer is doing something that he likes, but we don't actually attribute it to a doctor. But essentially, he is also doing something that he likes. He can never do something that he doesn't like. So I want you also to come to that point because at some point in time or the other, you are going to pursue your career in a clinical field, right? Even if you come to a non-clinical field, then you're going to be connected to the clinical field in so many, so many ways because a lot of questions are going to be bombarded at you. We ask the pathologist so many questions, we ask the microbiologist so many questions, we ask the pharmacology person so many questions, especially when we have doubts with respect to the case. So they are also contributing to us in a big way. So are the radiologists, so are the biochemistry people, everybody. So it's our total approach towards treating a patient. That's what really matters. So when I was doing my MBBS, this being clinical was an organic transformation. It was more not something that I deliberately had to do. First year of MBBS was not anything clinical, it was just learning anatomy and physiology. Once you pass your first year and after a break, you go and do, join your clinics, then it is full on clinical, right? Every day you have to take a case, every day you have to write a case sheet, every day you have to write a case sheet, CNS, CVS, DIT, RS. So this was a routine process and this routine process ensured that we never really knew that we became clinical at one point because we always knew that we were studying clinical. Okay, and the exam also expected us to be clinical. So the studying in parlance was a very easy job for us, right? So I think definitely that is the way clinical learning is something that we can't do overnight. Okay, so please understand that initially there may be a lot of hiccups. It's not going to be easy. It's a very, very tough road. But as we go on, as we go on, go on, what will happen is that it just starts happening for us because it's it's that kind of a thing where we really don't know exactly the day we, we started understanding things clinically. But at the point we know it will fall into the group, just like we drive a car. Initially, it's going to be full hiccup. But at some point, we'll start driving the car smoothly. So that's when we say that it has become very clinical. And whenever I think of the word clinical, clinical is not a word that we use in medicine alone. The clinical is a word that we use in so many, so many ways. We say clinical performance, right? And cricket is where we use this word clinical performance. And when I think of clinical performance, I don't think I can I can talk without without mentioning about this person. He is somebody who's been the most clinically clinical cricketer whom we have seen across the years. And that is James Anderson, renowned English fast bowler who is touching 40 now and is still the most dreaded pace bowler in the whole world. And that is just impeccable performance. He's somebody who keeps it very simple and very, very uncomplicated. He has a very smooth run up. He does not have a big side on jump. He lands perfectly. And he's been able to maintain his fitness all through these years. And it's because of his very uncomplicated running into a wicket with uh, extremely good performance, which is primarily because he has designed his action in such a way that he, he actually takes very minimal effort for him to deliver. But that is providing him with great results. And that's the reason why he's the first uh, fast bowler in the world to pick up 600 wickets. You look at somebody behind him with Courtney Watts, it is 500 wickets. So you see how much, how much he is like uh, gone to a level where at 40, he is the world's best fast bowler. We couldn't think of a fast bowler even in his 30s long back. Now it's becoming like so much, so much. 
uh, Jamie Anderson becoming the world's best fast bowler. So that's primarily because of the fact that he's very clinical in approach. So clinical is not a word that we use in medicine alone. It's something that we can use on a general basis. And in this discussion, I just try to sensitize you to what is clinical. Our theoretical videos are also more or less centered along clinical grounds. But through these discussions, we'll make you think of, okay, this was taught because of that. That was taught because of this. And essentially try to make you more happier and more fulfilling for you in the sense that, okay, you feel happy that you have studied medicine and it is that medicine that you're going to apply. So what we learn and what we apply are going to be more or less in sync. So on that note, let us start off with our first question. This question is actually a very, very special question for the reason that this patient mentioned here is a student of ours. So she is the patient and the diagnosis was also made by somebody who is at a very junior level. So it is their thought process that actually helped us to make the diagnosis. So let us see this very simple open-ended question to start off our discussion. This open-ended question is that of a 22-year-old medical student from North India. She is uh, a very easygoing, very normal girl who is a little underweight. Apart from that, she is perfectly all right. She is just walking through the veranda and reading her book and then she suddenly goes and jams her foot. It is not a big trauma. It's a very simple trivial trauma, okay? Nothing much to even think of, which she herself has not taken seriously. But within a few hours, it gets painful, it gets swollen and she goes to the casualty. She is taken by her friends to the casualty of the same college that she is studying. And in the casualty, they take an x-ray and find out that she has sustained a severe fracture, which is actually speaking disproportionate to the degree of trauma. So, very severe fracture. And they, they really don't talk much about it, trauma, fracture. They just do her routine blood examination. Routine blood examination means CBC, RFT and those things. And in that, they find hemoglobin is only 9.4, which also okay. She's a menstruating girl. She's 22 years old. So they think that's also fine. And everything is okay. Her BMI is only 18.7. So she's been like that for a long time. It's not like she has lost weight suddenly or anything ever since she can remember. As with most of the students, girls who actually watch her videos are very much underweight. I'm saying about these MBBS students, okay? Interns and post-interns are generally overweight. So... Uh, MBBS students generally underweight. So this is how uh, we, we see this case. So my question is, does this actually require an evaluation in the first place? One girl who had a trivial trauma, she had a fracture and then uh, she, her, everything is normal. You are dealing with the, uh, with the fracture now. That, that should be the end of it, right? Generally, in most of the centers, that would have been the end of it. But here we had a hero and the hero was the orthopedic PG. He is the hero here. He actually uh, told this girl that uh, I feel that for the degree of trauma you have had, this looks like a very, very severe fracture. I really don't think that this is something that you should have got at this stage, especially because your bone strength is something that peaks around 25 and 25 to 28 exercise when you have the best bone density. So he was telling about the fact that this is a fracture which I really don't think is along these lines. Okay, so she heard that, she heard that, she knew that. And she was also like, okay, we'll see. That's all. She didn't do anything at that point. For this 9.4, she went and met her uh, medicine person who is an assistant professor in her department. So he said that, okay, hemoglobin 9.4. Let's just try to evaluate and see what is this 9.4. That's again, so much, so much kudos to him. Most of the people would have just written it off. But he thought like, okay, 9.4 means we have to evaluate. And she was also insisting on evaluation because she has seen some of the videos. So she also thought that 9.4 is definitely low. It requires evaluation. And do you agree to that or you don't agree to that? Definitely you have to agree to that. Any girl who has a hemoglobin, which is less than 12 gram per deciliter has to be evaluated. Any male who has a hemoglobin less than 13 gram per deciliter has to be evaluated. So that's something which you made very clear. And it's a universal statement also. So because she has a hemoglobin of less than 12, it has to be evaluated. How do you evaluate this? So evaluation of any anemia in the world. So first of all, you look for hemoglobin, total count and your platelets because total count and platelets are involved. It becomes a trilineage problem. So here they are normal. So it is not a trilineage problem. It is just your RBC issue. So it's a hemoglobin issue. So we know that we are dealing with anemia. Yes, we are dealing with anemia. Correct. Anemia on the whole is of two types only. One, we have this hypoproliferative anemia, which has got some issue with production. And then you have this hyperproliferative anemia, which has got to do with destruction. So hypoproliferative, hyperproliferative, there are only two types of anemia. This hyperproliferative anemia is what we call hemolysis. So hemolysis happens more or less very acutely and the patient is going to be symptomatic and it's not going to present like this. Anyway, we know that. But the first step in any anemia evaluation has to be looking into the reticulocyte production index, which is exactly what we did. And that is our right step. As you can watch from the videos also, reticulocyte production index is what determines whether it's hyper or hyperproliferative. Because when the reticulocyte production index is less than 2 or more than 2.5, Okay, less than 2 to 2.5, you can say. Less than 2 is hyperproliferative, more than 2.5 is hyperproliferative. 2 to 2.5 is kind of a gray zone. So, more than 2.5 is hyper, less than 2 is hypo. And in her case, it was less than 2. Okay, so how do you calculate it? 
reticulocyte count do you get into hemoglobin of the patient divided by decide hemoglobin which you can pick up depending on the patient into 2 okay so you keep her decide hemoglobin as 12 into 2 into her actual hemoglobin now which is 9.4 right and her reticulocyte count was coming as almost 6 fine so her reticulocyte count was 6 6 to 9.4 by 12 into 2 which essentially means that this is on an average say 3 by 4 this is 3 right which is less than 2 fine so she had a reticulocyte production index which is less than 2 so when her reticulocyte production index was less than 2 we know otherwise also from clinical grounds we think that way only that this is a hypoproliferative anemia so in first place this is a case of a hypoproliferative anemia right so he he was able to find it out but that is very evident and she was also thinking along those lines only once you have a hypoproliferative anemia then comes this question of whether you are having a mcv that is normal to low or whether you are having a mcv that is high because if your mcv is high then it becomes a completely different discussion that is a macrocytic anemia macrocytic anemia has a totally different discussion in her case mcv was normal it was 86 femtoliter and 80 to 100 is normal so even if it is low or normal we have the same evaluation if it is high we have a different evaluation and that different evaluation i am not going to macrocytic is megaloblastic and all that non megaloblastic megaloblastic and so many causes so here we have this normal to low mcv so when you have this normal to low mcv and she has a normal mcv what do you think of so now we are thinking of hypoproliferative anemia some production problem mcv is normal it's not macrocytic in that case the first thing that you have to rule out is definitely iron deficiency anemia so the first thing that you have to rule out is iron deficiency anemia so he also told her that it looks like iron deficiency only and asked her about this very important question as to having is she having excess menstrual loss and she denied that completely she is having no excess menstrual blood loss so she is basically not thinking that anemia is due to blood loss so then probably you can even think that nine is it some nutritional like that but he decided that we have to evaluate so let us confirm whether it is iron deficiency anemia now so the next step is to look for iron indices okay the four iron indices serum ferritin serum iron tibc and percentage saturation of transferrin so that is what they decided to look for next okay so what is serum ferritin what is serum iron what is tibc what is percentage saturation of transferrin so serum ferritin is basically equal to your iron stores so whenever your iron stores are low in the marrow then your serum ferritin will fall so she has anemia basically meaning that iron deficiency anemia means iron stores in the marrow are low so serum ferritin has to be low when your serum ferritin is low the body will synthesize more transferrin the serum transferrin is what we actually call as tibc it is indirectly measured as tibc total iron binding capacity is actually equal to serum transferrin that is the amount of iron that transferrin can hold or the iron binding capacity of transferrin is what we call as tibc so whenever the iron stores are low the body will try to synthesize more transferrin naturally it will try to synthesize more transferrin serum transferrin will increase or tibc will increase correct so in iron deficiency anemia serum ferritin has to be low tibc has to be high serum iron is equal to the amount of iron in circulation that is bound to transferrin so total iron the transferrin can hold is tibc out of that actually how much amount of iron in circulation is bound to transferrin is your serum iron so when you look at serum iron serum iron is the amount of iron in circulation bound to transferrin this serum iron in circulation bound to transferrin is low correct so serum iron in circulation that is bound to transferrin is low because there is no iron so the amount of iron bound to transferrin in circulation is low so serum iron is low tibc is high if you put this serum iron divided by tibc into 100 as a ratio then you get percentage saturation of transferrin that means tibc is the actual amount of transferrin that we are having in circulation or the iron binding capacity total capacity out of the total iron the transferrin can hold in reality how much iron is bound to transferrin is your serum iron this you put as a ratio called serum iron by tibc into 100 and this is what is called percentage saturation of transferrin which will fall because serum iron will fall tibc will increase and in this girl we got exactly the same picture so ferritin was low iron was low tibc was high percentage saturation of transferrin was low without seeing this don't say iron deficiency anemia please 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 don't say iron deficiency anemia so you should be confirming that there is iron deficiency and then accordingly deciding what has to be done so this is the pattern that we get in iron deficiency anemia and in the videos you can see there's crux to this because serum ferritin is an acute phase reactant so even if ferritin is normal to high also you can have iron deficiency anemia so don't bank on ferritin all the time look for this also
because otherwise there can be a problem. You may think that there is iron deficiency, you may think there is no iron deficiency, but the patient may be having iron deficiency because ferritin is a acute based reactant. So if ferritin is low, then it is 100% iron deficiency. But if ferritin is normal or high, also you may have iron deficiency because of the reason that ferritin is a positive acute based reactant. Okay, that we've discussed in the videos. So this is the picture. Clear. So when you know this picture, so we come back to the case. So she was okay, uh, found out to have iron deficiency anemia. So all this happened in around three days' time. So in three days' time, she was I mean, diagnosed as iron deficiency anemia. How do you take this discussion forward now? So most of the time, what would have happened is this doctor would have given her iron tablets and sent her home. But this guy was very brilliant. He was actually pers persistently he was asking her this question: Are you having blood loss? So she was saying, No, I'm not having any excess blood loss. Because iron deficiency anemia, if you look on the whole, okay, iron deficiency anemia, if you look on the whole, the single most important reason for iron deficiency anemia is blood loss. That is why when in a female you have iron deficiency anemia, you most of the time attribute it to menstrual blood loss. Male having iron deficiency anemia, then you're really worried and you try to look into endoscopy, colonoscopy, those kind of things. Because male having iron deficiency anemia is due to GI blood loss unless proven otherwise. That's a dictum statement. Female having iron deficiency anemia, many people write off. Because of the fact that they think it is related to menstrual blood loss. But this guy was not willing for that. Because she did not give a history contributing. And she was saying that she was taking a normal diet. Although she has been on the low side as far as weight is concerned. But that is how she has been genetically. She was talking about this fact that she needs to get evaluated for this. That brings us to the crux. That is when she called me. So, okay. That is when I am entering into the picture. So, when I am entering into this picture, uh, this much things have been done. That boy has also done all these investigations. They're not boy, he's my age, he's the assistant professor there. He has done all these investigations and uh, she has also I mean, understood the fact that there needs to be an evaluation. So let us see how we take this forward now. So we have a 22 year old female who has suffered a fracture, okay, which we are not sure whether it is pathological fracture or not. We have not evaluated. We found out an iron deficiency anemia. Yes, we found out iron deficiency anemia. The cause of which also we don't know. This is where we are stuck. So this way we can evaluate, this way also we can evaluate. So this is a more easier route of evaluation. So I thought we will go that way. So let us just try to take the help of a table now. This is a table, which is a, what is a renowned table, any international book, you can see this. Why can a person get iron deficiency anemia? So you can see, a person can get iron deficiency anemia because of increase in demand. Second, they can get because of increase in blood loss. Third, they can get because of decrease in intake. Or four, they can get it because of a disorder with respect to absorption. So these are the four things. Here, there is no increase in demand. Increase in demand means uh, most importantly, uh, pregnancy or any growth spurt. Most important question for the exam is EPO therapy. Whenever you give EPO as a part of CKD anemia management, the patient will have increase in demand. There they can have iron deficiency. That's a discussed under CKD. I'm not going to that. Increase in blood loss is the single most important thing. Let's keep it that way. Decrease in intake has to be put last because... That is something that you kind of diagnose when you don't get anything else. Okay. So, two things you have to rule out. Blood loss issue is there. Absorption issue is there. These two things is the girl having or not. So, straight away that person told me she is not having any GA symptoms. So, why should we think of absorption issue? So, that is where I told no. There is a serious, serious point here. We have to be thinking of absorption issue because the absorption issue that we are thinking of may not have the classical GA symptoms. So, that is clear. Blood loss, she is not having any symptoms such as tuberculosis blood loss. She is not having any excess bleeding also. But let us go with the protocol. What is the protocol? The protocol is that any iron deficiency anemia is due to blood loss unless proven otherwise. Which means that let us do a upper GI endoscopy. Yes, we will do an upper GI endoscopy. Correct. Before doing upper GI endoscopy and then followed by colonoscopy if required. Before doing upper GI endoscopy, let us rule out this absorption problem because there is only one major absorption issue that we have to be worried about. This table, all this is actually wrong, so don't look it into. Absorption issue that we all have to be worried is the duodenal disease, okay, duodenal mucosal disease. Why duodenal mucosal disease? Because this duodenal mucosal disease will hamper ion absorption. This duodenal mucosal disease that we have to rule out is celiac disease. So, celiac disease is something where you can have iron deficiency anemia, the patient can present to you in so many, so many different ways. So, celiac is there in your mind. Nothing else is there in your mind here. And then after looking for celiac serology, you are planning for upper G endoscopy. That is a plan as of now. We do celiac disease serology and to our surprise, you see, she was celiac serology positive. And we did upper G endoscopy with the duodenal biopsy that also showed celiac. And this was actually a case of celiac disease. And celiac disease per se can actually have what is called fracture because celiac is a very very important cause of pathological fracture we will see that so all these things were fitting into the picture 
and she was finally diagnosed as having celiac disease. I'll just explain that a bit more to you. And this is a very, very striking diagnosis because it is something that if you put the patient on gluten restriction, they will become normal in a matter of six months. And she has became perfectly, perfectly normal. As in when she's tried to reduce gluten, she is becoming better and better and better because celiac doesn't present with diarrhea all the time. So we shall see. So a diagnosis that we got primarily because the person persevered with that and he knew that this had to be done in the exact format and because we followed the format. Had we not followed the format, we wouldn't have picked up anything like celiac here. Okay, so what is the important message here? Anybody with the iron deficiency anemia, so how you come to iron deficiency anemia, I told you. Single lineage disease, hyperproliferative anemia with the correct parameters. So you know iron deficiency anemia. Every iron deficiency anemia, think of GI loss, think of absorption issue. Okay, absorption issue that has to come to your mind is celiac disease. And once we rule out celiac disease, we go to GI loss, upper GI scopy. And if you are having evidence on any symptoms, you can even try lower GI scopy. Your NICE guidelines, UK guidelines say, Male means upper GI scopy followed by lower GI scopy is must. After ruling out all these things only, should you come to the last one that is nutritional. Okay, so that is the most important message. Such a beautiful message that we got out of this case and such a happy ending because celiac disease is something that is very much treatable also. It's like a very, very happy ending and really kudos to both of them for this girl also for persevering and actually getting us evaluated. Otherwise, it would have been completely wrong. So what are the most important messages that we have? One very important message that I told you, of course, is the fact that every iron deficiency anemia has to be evaluated. Another very, very, very important message that I really want to communicate with you, we'll come back to that, is that we could have gone another way also. Another way we could have gone is going behind the fracture. And going behind the fracture is definitely to take a DEXA scan. But in many centers, DEXA scan is not available. So that is a limiting point. But wherever possible, try and do a DEXA scan whenever you feel pathological fracture. Because if you do a DEXA scan in her, she is going to definitely have osteoporosis. And you can see that her T-score is going to be less than or equal to minus 2.5. That is definite. So if you have an osteoporosis at such a young age, then you may probably be tempted to look into certain things which are the common causes for osteoporosis. If a 22-year-old girl has osteoporosis, let us just try to make it very simple. What Or a boy has osteoporosis. We had a boy who had suffered a fracture like a completely different cause. So whenever you have somebody with disproportionate osteoporosis, first thing that comes to your mind is, is the patient being on steroids? So that boy, one, three, four cases I have seen. One case, this boy was on steroid for a long time because of nephrotic syndrome. So it's very easily understood that steroid is very, very important. Second is you have a patient who is in his mid 50s. So mid 50s and having osteoporosis, you don't expect because it's like a little early. In that case, you can contribute, attribute it to smoking and alcohol consumption because both are very, very strongly associated. So that is that scenario also you can think. But as far as my message is concerned, when you think of osteoporosis, especially in males, never, ever, ever fail to rule out hypogonadism because hypogonadism is a top cause. Hypogonadism, low testosterone levels, extremely, extremely important, very important cause. And alongside with that, always remember vitamin D and low calcium. They go hand in hand. But the most important three things that you have to keep in mind, middle-aged person means alcohol and smoking, young patient male hypogonadism, young patient male, again, celiac, we will come to that, female or, or female celiac and in general steroids. So these are the common causes. But see, we have a lot list of causes, you know, which can cause osteoporosis. So long, long, long list of causes. But inside this list of causes, five, six things are very important. Right here, you can see celiac. Celiac disease means you're having a duodenal issue as well as a jejunal issue. It's a proximal small intestine that gets involved. Proximal small intestine means the first two-fifth, okay, duodenum jejunum. And then part of jejunum and idiom, the later three-fifth is what we call distal small intestine. And from the proximal small intestine jejunum, you have all these vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin K, vitamin A. These are the fat-soluble vitamins plus calcium, phosphorus, all this getting absorbed. So that is the reason why celiac disease patients have very poor bone density and they're extremely susceptible to fracture. So this is one thing that you have to keep in mind. Second is multiple myeloma. Very, very important. So Whenever you think of fracture, again with disproportionate, I mean, disproportionate fracture for a trivial trauma, always, always keep in mind myeloma. Myeloma is something which we have to always keep in mind. Number three, Cushing syndrome. Yes, every time. Goes without saying, right? And we have discussed that in detail. Four patient is on anti-epileptic drugs. Okay, anti-epileptic drugs. Five, HIV patient. Six, hypercalciuria patient. These are the patients that you have to keep in mind. Celiac, multiple myeloma, Cushing's, antiepileptic, HIV, hypercalcuria. But apart from this, always remember CKD patient can have a fracture at any time because that is bone disease in CKD that we're not bringing into picture. But these many things in a naive patient you have to keep in mind. Rare causes like mastocytosis, all those things are there. That is not required now. At least these many things, if you keep in mind, it's perfectly fine.
okay so this is how that way we could have evaluated so two ways we can actually evaluate the same patient we have gone for the first route this way also you could have evaluated but because the exercise is not there it is a little difficult but again i'm telling you again and again i'm telling you your friend has a trivial trauma and a fracture always keep in mind celiac always keep in mind hypogonadism please ask for whether he's taking antiepileptics please see whether he's taking steroid fine if your father has osteoporosis and he's not gone to that age where he should be getting osteoporosis, then alcoholism, smoking, etc. can contribute. That is definitely there. But very importantly, rule out multiple myeloma. Don't think multiple myeloma is the disease of grandfathers. No, you're seeing a lot of patients mid 40s and early 50s getting myeloma. So please do rule out myeloma. And always have the habit of checking for hypercalciuria because that can also contribute. And apart from that, CKD patient, HIV patient, all of them. So that way also we could have actually evaluated this patient. But we went with the first route. So two ways we could have evaluated and we could have actually arrived at this very, very important diagnosis called celiac disease. And, and let us try to, in a nutshell, see what is celiac disease. The same question if they give you for the exam, they may actually give this clue also because this is a very vital clue. This girl did not have this, but many people with this disease actually have this manifestation this is vesicular lesions blistering lesions which are sometimes crusted that you can actually see on the back that you can see on the forearm that you can see on the elbow etc this is called dermatitis herpetiformis dermatitis herpetiformis is something that we see part and parcel with celiac it is actually speaking unusual to see without celiac so every time you have a question on celiac generally to make it easy and for the student to actually correlate this is a case where i have not given anything because it happened live in front of us like that this girl did not have dermatitis herpetiformis or anything but if i were setting a question for the exam and i want an answer of celiac with this much data for the student to think and write it is celiac he should be very good so we don't want that level of understanding so we will put a clue like this this is the clue that if i were the examiner i would have put this clue because you should be able to identify that it's dermatitis herpetiformis and then you know that it is dermatitis herpetiformis every time you think of it you link it to celiac and once you link it to celiac, you can link that same celiac to hemoglobin of 9.4, that same celiac to fracture. So you link everything together. Okay, this is how a clinical question works. This is how a clinical question works. This is how a MRCP question also works. In the MRCP question, the advantage is that you will be having five options. So with those five options, you can actually take the discussion to wherever you want. And you basically can, uh, what is it that we learn as we do more and more questions. You can put the answers in the question and see, like we saw our mathematics questions for engineering entrance, etc. You put the answer in the question and see. You put the first option in the answer question and see, second option in the question and see. And that way also you can discuss. And that way also you can actually come to a conclusion. Okay, so that's it. So before we go to the next question, I'll just try to tell you a few points about this and that is celiac and where does celiac stand in 2022 celiac disease is a perfect example of what we call as physician unawareness okay that means why we don't diagnose celiac disease is because we are unaware of celiac disease what is this unawareness this unawareness is that only 50 percent of people with celiac disease have gi related symptoms what we call the so-called malabsorption symptoms when somebody has malabsorption symptoms, any Tom, Dick and Harry can diagnose celiac disease because celiac disease will come with perfect malabsorption symptoms and the most cardinal malabsorption symptom is diarrhea because your uh, I mean, contents are not being absorbed in the intestine, you will come into the large intestine, increase the osmolality, water will be drawn from the epithelial cell and you will have diarrhea. That is called the typical osmotic diarrhea. So whenever you evaluate for diarrhea, Osmotic secretory, we, we have seen that, no? small bowel versus large bowel, osmotic versus secretory, all that we have discussed. So, if it is an osmotic diarrhea, then you know how to approach and then you will find out celiac. So, diagnosing celiac from a GI issue is not at all a problem, which many people actually do. But the problem is this disease, only 50% have GI symptoms. So, that is why it becomes a very important discussion. And that is why for every exam also, they will try to put a question on celiac because so many options are there in front of us to put a question on celiac. Similarly, we have something called classic latent silent atypical somebody who presents with all these classical symptoms gi symptoms that is what i told you 50 percent they have what is called classical celiac disease atypical celiac disease means you are having symptoms like this girl like a fracture or something but your symptoms are not gi so that means you are having non-gi symptoms that is your atypical celiac disease silent celiac disease means you are having no symptoms you are just having serology positive. You are just a serology positive, but having no symptoms, that is called a silent celiac disease. And latent celiac disease means even serology is also not there. You are HLA positive, that is HLA DQ2 or DQ8. This DQ2, DQ8 is very, very important. Okay, one line of question we ask this so many times. HLA DQ2 or DQ8 has to be present, otherwise, there is no celiac. If you want to rule out celiac, in a very tough, complicated case, you are like thinking celiac, but you want to rule it out, means you can check for DQ2 or DQ8. If DQ2 and DQ8 are not there, you can say it's not celiac. That's why celiac is an example for what we call this iceberg disease okay it's an iceberg disease where we're seeing only 50 percent here who are 
having GA symptoms. The remaining 50% are missing. Okay. So, that is why that is very important to understand. Now, what else can I actually tell you? Symptoms of malabsorption are very easy. So, diarrhea, abdominal distension, fouls, meaning stool, weight loss, etc. You will never miss celiac. One catch point in that is IBS-like symptoms, 30% of the people can have. So, when somebody comes with the IBS, okay, you know how to approach IBS. I have taken that as a separate module. And you know that you have to be ruling out organic, ruling out organic issue, organic issue, organic issue. So, you don't feel there is anything organic and you think, okay, it is Pakka IBS. Still remember that celiac can have IBS symptoms, Pakka IBS-like symptoms. On a dangerous note, let me tell you, many patients with colon cancer can have IBS-like symptoms. So, uh, depends on the setting. Young patient for a long time having IBS, uh, having IBS-like symptoms attributable to, attributable to a particular stressor. Okay, you take it easy. But suddenly developing IBS-like symptoms at any point, okay, suddenly developing IBS-like symptoms at any point, please keep colonic malignancy in mind. And also remember, celiac disease patients can have simple IBS-like symptoms. So, when you see a patient with IBS-like symptoms, may it be your own friend or your own colleague also, there is no harm in ruling out celiac. It's a very simple ruling out process which you will see. There is no harm in ruling out celiac. So, that's another message that I want to give you. But the most striking message is this, atypical celiac, which means that atypical settings always, always keep celiac in mind. And those are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, which we should never, ever forget because you can have any question like this. Anybody who has disproportionate osteopenia, that's what we discussed as a fracture. You have to be thinking of celiac. Iron deficiency anemia, always think of celiac. Ataxia peripheral neuropathy because this vitamin E and K are again being absorbed from their right, especially vitamin E. So, this E is a fat soluble vitamin from the proximal small intestine absorbed. So, when there is a deficiency, ataxia peripheral neuropathy, short stature and failure to thrive in a child. This is so unique about celiac man. So that means celiac is a disease that you can see in children, in adults, in elderly, males, females, everywhere. So, short stature and failure to thrive in a child. And a symptomatic rise in LFT. That is what we see. And now we find that many cases that we diagnosed yesterday as cryptogenic cirrhosis. We got a big class, big list of conditions, right? I mean, big list of causes for cirrhosis and many a times nothing would fit and we would write on the case sheet as cryptogenic cirrhosis. I've seen so many people with cirrhosis walking around with a notebook having cryptogenic cirrhosis written. Now we think many of them may be because of, because of celiac. So, that is it. So, so many, many, many things are attributed. These five questions are very important. Endocrinology wise, you can get amenorrhea infertility etc all these things are described okay described but not very common but these settings in your exam clinical setting always always keep in mind and that is why very very important indian society of gastroenterology has told us this what we thought as cryptogenic cirrhosis for transaminitis yesterday is today being proved as celiac what we thought as idiopathic short states in the child has today been proved as celiac what we thought of refractory and deficiency anemia has been again proven as celiac what we thought of cerebellar ataxia without any particular cause is now again proven as celiac so anything can actually come like this okay very simple right very very simple now the next catch point in this is celiac whenever they give you for the exam, celiac has so many associations, right? So, because of these so many associations, these associations are very important to remember. So, I told you the most important association that is dermatitis herpetiformis. So, look out for those skin lesions. That can be a clue. Second, they may give in the question that patient is a known case of type 1 DM. Type 1 DM and celiac have a very, very, very strong association. So, that may be there in the question. IgA deficiency or IgA nephropathy also. That also may be there in the question. So, when you have dermatitis herpetiformis, type 1 DM, IgA nephropathy, even something called this bird fancier's lung, okay, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, that also can be there in the question. So, when you see any of this, and even for that matter, autoimmune hypo or hyperthyroidism, when you get in the question that autoimmune setting is there and you are not able to place it somewhere, always keep celiac in mind. Celiac associations are very strong. Very strongly, I feel that for the exam, they want to put a question on celiac, they can of course keep dermatitis herpetiformis as a photograph or an image type 1 dm they can give iga deficiency or ig nephropathy they can give some bird fancy or lung like in the presentation they can give hypo or hyperthyroidism also they can give in the question in this question because it is a real thing nothing of this was there but again if they give it as a question this can be the answer yes so when you are in doubt of celiac what do you do when you are in doubt of celiac nothing else it is very simple serology plus biopsy diagnosis okay serology and biopsy together in serology, it is IgA, anti-TTG. That is the most sensitive and specific now. That is what we do by ELISA. I am not going to the details of why endomyxia. That is what I am not going to do. Biopsy again, you know, villus atrophy, crypt hyperplasia. Okay, total mucosal thickness will be the same, but villus atrophy, crypt hyperplasia. Some lamina propria infiltrates will also be there and some degree of acular degeneration may be there. But these are the two most catch findings. And when these two are there, you know that it is equal to celiac. So, serology plus biopsy, always equal to celiac. 
remember serology is positive but biopsy is negative okay serology is positive plus biopsy is negative or biopsy is negative serology is positive sorry biopsy is positive serology is negative these two permutations also they can give you if biopsy is positive and serology is negative it is never celiac because the same biopsy finding of celiac can be seen in 100 other conditions from cow milk cow's milk intolerance to tropical sprue to so many conditions so biopsy positive serology negative means no point serology positive biopsy negative means go for rebiopsy because it is still very likely to be celiac because these antibodies have very high sensitivity specificity so because of that go for rebiopsy and if both are negative and it is not celiac. So if you are having doubt, there's two things. Get a gastroenterology consultation, do upper the endoscopy biopsy. Before that itself, you have the serology club that's diagnosis. Okay. And lastly, treatment part is all about gluten restriction. Okay. It's just about gluten restriction. In six months, the patient will come back to normal. Okay. If you restrict gluten, 90% of the time inside six months, the patient will come back to normal. Clinically will become normal. Histologically also will become normal in 90% inside six months. Which means that they cannot take wheat they cannot take barley they cannot take rye they cannot take oats these are the four things absolutely forbidden rice corn maize etc anything you can take so what exactly they can take is beyond the scope of our discussion but there are so many sources of gluten which a dietitian has to actually talk about but on a on a clinical note let me tell you butter cheese ice cream french fries cornflakes pickles okay if you are seeing some friend of yours with this please do advise them that only 10% people are actually unfortunate in this group because they don't respond to gluten restriction. They are having what is called refractory celiac disease. And in refractory celiac disease, we give them steroids. So, refractory celiac alone, we give them steroids. And refractory celiac is a pre-malignant condition. Very, very important. Asked 100 times for the exam. Refractory celiac can be a precursor for enteropathy associated T-cell lymphoma, small intestine adenocarcinoma, esophageal squamous cell carcinoma. All those are theoretical points which you can see from the video also. But how you relate it to a clinical case is what we have actually seen okay so this is our first clinical discussion again two very very important drive drive home points the two most important drive home points is actually this slide is the most important drive home thing that is anything that was cirrhosis yesterday could be celiac today anybody with short stature could be celiac today refractory antifacial anemia celiac today cerebellar attacks is celiac today and another case of type 1 dm they did not find out celiac in type 1 dm and anemia workup should be very clear short stature in a child osteopenia in adult attacks of peripheral neuropathy raised alert Okay, that brings us to the end of the first discussion on this beautiful disease called celiac, which is all about this term called physician unawareness. And let us try to be better physicians to figure it out. Okay, so we go to the second open ended case. Again, this happens to be a medical student and again, girl. So, 27 year old girl who is actually gone for a trip. Okay, she is post MBBS. She is gone for a trip to um, Dehradun and started noticing pain. Okay, this is the first thing that she can remember. Okay, that she doesn't really remember anything uh, before that okay so she she is actually kind of giving a history on probing more than anything else so let, let us see from where i i saw the case i'll tell you later on so first thing that she has noticed is that um, she has come back from this place and there is for the first time that she noted skin tightening uh, and this is more or less like upper limb tightening upper limb is getting very tight it is getting painful and uh, it is almost like um, she she can't do anything in cold okay she understands there's something got to do with cold because it is that cold that is actually kind of incapacitating her more than anything else and uh, she comes back she comes back and she notices that there is some kind of a discoloration now this is not exactly her photo but i think this is very similar to this like this some kind of a discoloration is what she is talking of and uh, she was like okay it will go away nothing much like that okay but she then thought of the fact that when she has been washing her clothes, there has been always some kind of a pain. Okay. Pain has been there like at least for around say eight months or one year or so. She's been having this. But then because it's there for a long time, she also got used to that. And now she started noticing that the, the color is almost like changing. The color is changing, changing. And it's some kind of a gangrene setting in. And it's almost like things are turning from bad to worse. You can see, you know, digital extremities have become almost like gangrenous. This is getting very serious, right? Because this is a, this is something which you don't expect. Absolutely not. This is pretty okay, but this is like definitely not okay. And um, we, we, I have not seen her at that point also. And this is not like exactly uh, what she expected. This is exactly been the progression of this particular case. Um, she was like getting bad getting bad but she was not getting any other symptom okay not getting any other symptom 
at this point uh, she has seen a physician okay who has told her that your symptoms are more or less like Raynaud's okay he has been told that if symptoms are more or less like Raynaud's and she was given Bosendan she was given Losartan okay Bosendan and Losartan were given for Raynaud's and she also thought that okay this may be Raynaud's but she knew that Raynaud's had some association with some rheumatology problem and all that but this person did not encourage any such kind of discussions he was like convinced that this is Raynaud and you okay you'll be fine like that but she was not getting fine she was not getting fine was okay but the more distressing part of it was that she was starting to get more and more symptomatic and she was starting to get more and more fatigue she was starting to get more and more dysnic um, and clinical examination every time they did was unremarkable unremarkable and nobody was figuring out as to exactly what was happening to her okay this is the patient okay very very vague presentation very strange presentation and very likely to come for the exam also but then you'll be getting few details here and there how much what did you understand at this point you understood that this is a young girl who has presented with Raynaud's phenomenon Raynaud's phenomenon is something that you experience for the first time when you get exposed to cold because when you are from Tamil Nadu you are never getting exposed to cold at any point so for the first time when you get exposed to cold you will start getting symptoms symptoms means you'll get pain tightness numbness this is what you're going to get and then you will try to correlate it with what happens when you dip your hands in cold water. So, if you are having the habit of washing your clothes, then you would definitely dip your hands in cold water. So, if you dip your hands in cold water, then you will note that your hand generally turns very pale. Then it becomes cyanosed kind of thing to, or that's what is called as becoming blue. And then once you take your hand out the water, then there is redness. This is called pallor cyanosis and redness on rewarming. Okay. This is pallor cyanosis and redness on rewarming. This is what happens in Raynaud. So, when you dip your hands in cold water, it becomes pale and then you are having pain and tightness. Then it becomes blue and then once you take out, it becomes red. This is what is Raynaud. So, this girl also had an idea before going and seeing that person that, okay, this is Raynaud. Uh, because it is similar to what we are talking about. Because she correlated her uh, washing clothes history with what is happening now and you know that, okay, fine. The mistake is that evaluation for Raynaud is not done. That is the gross mistake. Treatment for Raynaud is a different thing, but treating Raynaud is only after you evaluate for Raynaud. But here, what was the evaluation done? No, no evaluation was done. That was a big mistake. There we lost time. We'll come back to that. What evaluation should have been done? So, whenever you see a girl with Raynaud, you have to be knowing as to whether it is primary or secondary Raynaud. This is the first thing. Okay, because primary Raynaud is a very benign entity. It is called Raynaud's disease. Okay, as you know. But secondary Raynaud is not at all benign. It is associated with connective tissue disease. Yes, that is a problem. And secondary Raynaud is associated with some dangerous connective tissue disease. One is systemic sclerosis. Another one is Jogren syndrome. Another one is this polymyositis and dermatomyositis. So, these three very bad associations. Notorious associations. That is there. Nobody even thought of it. So, is it primary Raynaud? Is it secondary Raynaud? How can you actually say? Both of them have similar presentation. So, how do you know? Primary Raynaud generally presents somewhere before 20 years, okay. Secondary Raynaud generally happens after 30 years. This is what we study. But this girl falls in the middle of that, so you can't say. Primary Raynaud has a very positive family history. Positive, positive family history. Here, family history is not contributory. But primary Raynaud, there is positive family history. In primary Raynaud and secondary Raynaud, clinically, the most important differentiating factor is in primary Raynaud, there are going to be no features of critical limb ischemia. That is the most important part. It is going to be benign, it is going to stay benign. Whereas in secondary Raynaud, in due course, the patient is going to develop what is called critical limb ischemia. And critical limb ischemia means that you are going to develop ulcers and gangrene. And that is exactly what has happened and she has gone on and developed these ulcers and gangrene. So, critical limb ischemia is the most important point of difference between primary and secondary. And nail fold capillary microscopy. Nail fold capillaroscopy, as we call it, is the most best investigation to differentiate because we can see distorted capillaries and all in secondary. That is not our discussion. It's not a theoretical, it's a clinical discussion. So, critical limb ischemia, if you find out it is secondary, in her case, that was not evaluated for and she has critical limb ischemia. So, when she has critical limb ischemia, then it goes without saying that this is a case of secondary Raynaud. This is a case of secondary Raynaud. Correct. Okay. So, that is there. Otherwise, also the word extreme pain has been mentioned and that she is actually going in for more and more symptoms and progression, etc. Naturally, it means that it is secondary Raynaud. So, look out for any of these things in the question. Once you know that it is secondary Raynaud, what did I tell you? Secondary Raynaud means systemic sclerosis, Jogren, polymyositis, dermatomyositis. These many things have to come to your mind. Also, mixed connective tissue disease, but that's a little more higher level. So, these four things have to come to your mind. 
of which even before you think of these other DDs, the first thing that has to come to your mind is systemic sclerosis. Without thinking of systemic sclerosis, don't think of anything else. Okay. Think of systemic sclerosis, systemic sclerosis, systemic sclerosis. When you think of Raynaud's. So, can this be a pointer? We don't know. Okay. So, let us try to get some theory going now. Systemic sclerosis is divided into diffuse systemic sclerosis and limited systemic sclerosis. This terminology itself should be thrown into the basket because this is what gets many students caught off guard. Okay. So, let us see what is this. Diffuse systemic sclerosis and limited systemic sclerosis, so diffuse sclerotrauma and limited sclerotrauma are terms that we use just depending on the extent of the skin lesion, that is all. When you get skin lesions everywhere, it is called diffuse sclerotrauma. When you get skin lesions distal to the elbow and on the face only, okay, distal to the elbow and on the face only, then you call it as limited sclerotrauma. Otherwise, it doesn't mean that this is a bad disease and this is a good disease, nothing like that. Okay, please be very clear, nothing like that. It is just dependent on the extent of skin lesion. So, that is all what we can tell now, okay. But the most important point, which we have discussed in the videos also, is that Raynaud can actually help us. Diffuse sclerotrauma patient has a short-lasting Raynaud and it is not severe, okay. Whereas limited sclerotrauma patient has a long-standing Raynaud and it is very, very severe. So, whenever you think of severe Raynaud, long-standing Raynaud in the context of sclerotrauma, then it is not diffuse, it is limited systemic sclerosis or limited sclerotrauma that you are going to talk about, okay. So, that has to be very clear. So, that is where most students, because they didn't have that next level understanding, will be caught off guard in this question. So, what they mean here is that a young girl who is having severe Raynaud phenomenon, that photo of gangrene developing, is all likely to contribute to limited systemic sclerosis, is all likely to contribute to limited systemic sclerosis. And if you get a question like this for the exam, then any of these other things may be there because it is very much part of the syndrome called Crest syndrome. So, here in this particular case, it was not there, but it can be part of Crest syndrome. So, if they put a question like this for the exam, they are going to be giving something like Crest syndrome, where C stands for calcinosis cutis, R stands for this Raynaud that we are talking about, E stands for esophagitis, which can be like a GRD or something like that, S stands for sclerodactyly, which is sclerotum of the fingers, and T stands for tear injectase. Always keep in mind, when you study systemic sclerosis, our idea is that it is fibrosis, fibrosis, that is diffuse. In limited, it is not that, it is this way. And they can even give you this antibody, which is called your anti-centromere antibody. So, anti-centromere antibody, they can give you crest-like picture, they can give you severe Raynaud, they can give you all that should make you think of limited systemic sclerosis. This is a case of limited sclerotrauma. Okay, this is a case of limited sclerotrauma. Clear. So, hope the evaluation part is very clear. You understood that they are talking about Raynaud because cold exposure is leading on to pain, tightness, numbness, etc, etc. So, you know it is Raynaud. Raynaud is primary and secondary. Secondary Raynaud is more severe, more devastating. Critical limb ischemia is there. Critical limb ischemia photo is there. So, you know that it is secondary Raynaud. Once it is secondary Raynaud, then most important disease condition to rule out is systemic sclerosis. In systemic sclerosis, diffuse is there, limited is there. But diffuse has a very short history, not very significant Raynaud, not very painful Raynaud, not critical limb ischemia so much. So, when there is critical limb Limb ischemia in the context of semi sclerosis, we are thinking of limited sclerotrauma. So, we have to be thinking of limited sclerotrauma here. Limited sclerotrauma is very often associated with which syndrome? Crest syndrome. So, in another question, they can give you something contributing like this teal injectase on the face, calcinosis due to somewhere in the joints, or some kind of esophagitis, some sclerotactyly, something like that. So, Crest syndrome. And Crest syndrome, which antibody you have to remember? Crest syndrome, you always have to keep in mind this antibody called anti syndrome antibody. For detailed discussion on this, you can watch scleroma, that's not required. So, we are stuck with or we are having the idea that, okay, there is limited scleroma. Fine. Now, I will add on to this. Eight months time, this progress to fatigue and breathlessness, progress to fatigue and breathlessness. Examination was unremarkable for most of the people. Okay, now, I'll tell you when she got a catch. She was having these symptoms, she was having breathlessness and she went and saw one of her seniors, who is again a medicine person. This fellow actually examined her and told her, told her that she has to meet a pulmonologist. Okay, she has to meet a pulmonologist. Not exactly sure why he told like that. And that is when I also came into the case. He felt that she was having a very loud P2, she was having a palpable P2 and she was having parasternal heave. This is what he told me. Loud P2 is there, palpable P2 is there, parasternal heave is there. There is no murmur that he can pick out, but he is not sure of whether there is some murmur in the lower left sternal border. These many things he was able to pick out. Oh, that is quite strange, right? That is quite strange. So, I told him like uh, before sending to the pulmonologist itself, why can't you send the patient to the cardiologist and see because what if you found out what is there like. 
cardiologist on seeing the patient agreed to his findings and he straight away did the echo okay and echo he found out that this patient was having right ventricular hypertrophy okay found out that the patient was having right ventricular hypertrophy with significant tricuspid regurgitation so the murmur was probably lower left sternal border tricuspid regurgitation murmur which increases on inspiration so he found out r which he found out tr and because of adding up everything together he found out that the patient has significant pulmonary hypertension significant pulmonary hypertension so this girl has pulmonary hypertension correct now can you correlate everything together diffuse systemic sclerosis or diffuse scleroderma is also a bad disease limited scleroderma is also a bad disease mortality is very very high diffuse scleroderma is a bad disease because of the fibrosis that sets in and that fibrosis is ild okay that fibrosis is in the lung and that is ild and that ild is of so many times but generally it is nsip with a fibrosing pattern this is the most common cause of death in diffuse scleroderma limited scleroderma generally ild is not there even renal failure is also not there but in limited scleroderma what kills the patient is pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary hypertension is the dreaded complication of a limited scleroderma, which is drug refractory, which has no basic treatment and which can actually lead on to very dangerous complications. So, the first case our diagnosis resulted in good results for that girl. But in this case, our diagnosis really does not translate into good results because the disease is bad. So, this is pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary hypertension can be actually speaking not very symptomatic, it can have very generalized fatigue, breathlessness, nothing much significant, nothing much symptomatic and that is why this was also missed for a long time. Hope you are clear with this. So, essentially this is a case of secondary Raynaud. Okay, secondary Raynaud limited systemic sclerosis pulmonary hypertension this is the case correct and unremarkable was except for a loud palpable p2 loud palpable p2 plus parasternal heave yes loud palpable p2 plus parasternal heave now this whole thing comes into picture okay so we started with Raynaud we went to secondary Raynaud we went to cause for secondary Raynaud we went to scleroderma there we went to limited system is closed, limited scleroderma and there we are actually getting this complete thing into picture because that is the most dreaded complication, most dreaded complication. Okay, so I think that literally kind of clears this. Pulmonary hypertension is of class 1, class 2, class 3, class 4, class 5 is miscellaneous but there are these are the four classes. Out of this what we are talking of is primary pulmonary hypertension primary pulmonary hypertension this primary pulmonary hypertension is due to pulmonary arteriolar problem so it's more of a arteriolopathy okay arteriolopathy and this is idiopathic many a times but sometimes can be due to drugs and sometimes can be due to limited scleroma these are the other secondary causes that you have to keep in mind this is exactly what we are talking of class 2 is a cardiac related pulmonary hypertension so that is not called pulmonary artery hypertension class 3 is a lung related thing Okay, lung related thing and class 4 is chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. Chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. This is what it is. Okay, this again you can see a big discussion. We have done a module on that. Like for example, we say V is equal to I into R, correct, in physics, where voltage across the circuit is equal to current into resistance, that is Ohm's law. Here voltage you can actually take as the pressure difference across the circuit, that is your pulmonary artery pressure minus your left atrial pressure that is equal to your current that is cardiac output into resistance that is your pulmonary vascular resistance correct which means that your pulmonary artery pressure will be equal to cardiac output into pulmonary vascular resistance plus your left atrial pressure correct in pulmonary vascular resistance increases then you will start getting pulmonary artery pressure increasing and that is called pulmonary hypertension that is what we are talking of in class 1 if your left atrial pressure increases then also your pulmonary artery pressure will increase that is equal to class 2 Correct. That is what we see in a cardiac cause, like a mitral stenosis, for example. Okay, so this is the pulmonary artery pressure that we are talking of. Right. Similarly, you can say, man, it's like instead of pulmonary artery pressure, you take your systemic artery pressure is equal to cardiac output into systemic vascular resistance plus your right atrial pressure. Okay, so then you can understand that both these things we can correlate to so many other things and go on. That's again theoretical discussion, not required now. So in this case, the most most important part is this one. Fine. They can also maybe give you with this a PFT and confuse you. They can give you a PFT. They can give you something like a HRCT and all that and confuse you. Because on a PFT, you can have ILD like picture or a pulmonary hypertension like kind of picture. Correct. 
ind like picture means we are thinking more in terms of diffuse sclerotrauma pulmonary hypertension like picture you are thinking in terms of limited sclerotrauma so that way please go back and study your pft be very clear with this diffuse is intraparenchymal restrictive ild right intraparenchymal restrictive which means that fev1 by fpc will be normal to increased pc will be low dlco will be low diffusion is impact capacity is impact but ratio is actually normal to increase whereas in pulmonary hypertension which is a vascular thing nothing will happen to fev1 by fpc that is normal even fpc is also normal dlco is the only thing that is affected because it is vascular so if you look at fpc fpc in a vascular problem will be normal whereas fpc in a ild is going to be low so with this you can actually spot a difference this is another question asked for the exam from the pft side of this in case you get a pft but even if you don't know to read a pft as well you still take a question like this and you understand it is limited sclerotrauma then the route ahead is actually going to be far less complicated and you can very easily come to the conclusion okay so this is a simple question but again i'm trying to tell you i'm just sensitizing you to the roots okay sensitizing you to the roots to find out the roots and give you ways to actually go forward okay that means many students will find it out that it is rain on but remaining things as and when you are more and more clinically oriented clinically oriented you will be able to come to the answers okay so that's about this these are the list of antibodies that you have to study in this please go back and see the video because that is like a very important theory question but just i want you to keep in mind in diffuse sclerotrauma single most important antibody is anti topoisomerase antibody and in limited sclerotrauma the single most important antibody is anti centromere antibody these are the two most important things and these clinical features everything we have discussed always keep in mind ild cardiac involvement renal involvement these are three things that are always more common in diffuse whereas git involvement and pulmonary hypertension are the two things which are more classically seen in limited the moment you get ulcers or gangrene photo don't think twice it is severe rain or critical ischemia always think always think limited 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 other diseases also don't forget jogren syndrome can present this limited can present with critical ischemia and and ulcers and gangrene mctd can also present like that so can polymyositis dermatomyositis okay and if polymyositis dermatomyositis presents like that always keep in mind this antibody called anti synthetase antibody what we call the anti jo1 antibody which you can again go and see these are the other three things that can come as a question they can also start from here that means they can also give an x ray relating to these symptoms and start x ray you can see bilateral bibasal reticular nodular infiltrates correct bilateral bibasal reticular nodular infiltrates you can see that for this bilateral bibasal reticular nodular infiltrate naturally you have to do a ct and CT will show you just the GGOs. So, when CT shows only GGOs and you are having bilateral bibasal reticular nodular infiltrates, then you know that you are dealing with what? You are dealing with NSIP and non specific interstitial pneumonia. Non specific interstitial pneumonia very often has a rheumatological cause. And the single most important rheumatological cause that has to come to your mind is systemic sclerosis. And in systemic sclerosis, ILD is mostly associated with diffuse. That is another way that they can actually bring you to this question. So, so many routes I am discussing that is not to confuse you, but to sensitize you and to understand that different, different angles can be explored. So, once we study the theory, all these angles will open up in front of us. We, we will not be in a position to apply that. But when we discuss more and more clinical stuff, we will be able to apply it to numerous, numerous, numerous other things. Okay. So, this is a discussion where two subjects we have, two topics or two chapters rather we have handled. One is from lungs, that is pulmonary hypertension, and the other one is actually from rheumatology, that is Raynaud's phenomenon, systemic sclerosis. In the first case, we handle a gastro disease, that is celiac, which is presented with an endocrine problem, that is a fracture, and is also at the same time having a hematological issue, that is anemia. So, that is how the discussion has been. Okay, so we go to the third case. This is a much more easier case. I think every, most of you will be able to relate to this. A 23 year old girl presents with sudden onset of pain. This is actually an MRCP question, okay? Sudden onset of pain and swelling in her left lower limb. Uh, lasting hardly three to four days okay no fever no signs of cellulitis they have themselves given the diagnosis clinically looking like dvt okay so clinically looking like dvt rest unremarkable except for some non-healing after sulcers that she's been having for some time so it's a very straightforward question so this is a young onset dvt okay young onset dvt no provoking factors nothing has been given no provoking factors. We'll see what provoking factors are, etc. So, young onset DVT, nothing has been given in this paper and nothing has been given in this question. This is a simple, uh, but just looking for some kind of integration from your side. So, this is the DVT picture that is also given. So, very easy. You can see a Doppler sonogram of the up lower limb. A Doppler sonogram of the lower limb, you can see that 
there is no waveform here again meaning some occlusion and you can see vein is not compressible and you can see the clot inside so very easy this is so this question is like you are having a dvt in a young girl any no precipitating factor how will you take the discussion forward so it's just that you need to be knowing the workup of this so that's why when the exam turns into this format clinical people who are studying in these so called hyped up colleges will have an advantage definitely when it is just a theoretical exam then there is no big advantage for anyone it depends on how much you study but here for people who have seen these three cases and seen what's happening with respect to these cases in their ward and their ip and their icu for them uh, any kind of a help from my side won't be required but for the others definitely these discussions would help okay so uh, let us just try to dig deep into this case how do you how do you look about this so young onset dvt no provoking factors let me just show you this table which many of you may have seen yeah when you when you look into a patient like this first and foremost is recent surgery trauma immobilization pregnancy puparium ocp this is the list you know it's a checklist and every house will be having this checklist whether any of these things are applicable recent surgery not applicable fracture not applicable immobilization not applicable pregnancy preparing not applicable ocp not applicable so this is something which all of us have to know anybody who comes with the dvt first set of things that we look for are prior surgery immobilization pregnancy preparing oral contraceptive everybody looks so this is not there correct if this is not there then we look for inherited causes okay inherited causes for a dvt and that inherited causes presenting now she is exactly 23 years old inherited causes would generally present somewhere in adolescence but okay 23 is fine what are the inherited causes that you want to look for most important is factor of ileid mutation so that you get as a kit you know so you can send for all these causes together to on quest lab or some any standard labs like that so factor of ileid mutation anti thrombin 3 deficiency protein c deficiency protein s deficiency so factor of ileid mutation and thrombin 3 deficiency protein c deficiency protein s deficiency these things you can actually check for here all nothing like that has been mentioned okay in the question and these things uh, if mentioned then that would be the answer so here we are looking at something different i guess totally different because we are not having any inherited cause or no evidence for any inherited cause we know the common risk factors which are generally there so that is also not there to be seen okay that is also not there to be seen which means are we dealing with something different let us try and dig deep into this case now so there is a dvt but we don't know the actual cause okay let us try to look into medical conditions which can be associated with the dvt what are the medical conditions where you have to be thinking or thinking in terms of dvt of course the first thing is occult malignancy malignancies especially adenocarcinomas can present with recurrent recurrent thrombosis here there is no recurrent thrombosis but occult malignancy is something that i want to i want to keep in mind but young girl 23 years nothing else so again not not quite much second most common cause for acquired thrombophilia the most common cause for acquired thrombophilia is the most common cause for acquired thrombophilia is anti phospholipid antibodies and aps aps can present with an arterial stroke or a venous stroke or a combined arterial and venous stroke we have done big time discussions on aps but no evidence for aps but still aps is chance high chance high chance okay then hematological conditions which can have a thrombotic state hematological conditions which can have thrombosis are mostly these myeloproliferative neoplasms polycythemia rubravira essential thrombocytosis myelofibrosis primary myelofibrosis but those are not seen at 23 years correct so not seen at 23 years so myeloproliferative neoplasms although i keep in mind i don't want to consider so much second is heparin induced thrombocytopenia hit but again heparin use and all is not there then pnh pnh can present with thrombosis i will keep pnh in mind but again not up in the list aps i will keep in mind pnh also i can keep in mind so okay so aps is there pnh is there so these many things i get from this kind of a discussion correct so medical conditions malignancy aps pnh these are the things only which i will keep in mind that's why this question is actually speaking a very strange question now comes the most valid point inside this whole question okay and that is non healing after sulcus how can you link non healing after sulcus to thrombosis to determine whether you answer this question or not any young person with non healing after sulcus clinically or non healing after sulcus mentioned in your question paper has to be has to be always always screened for bechet's disease always screened for bechet's disease the mediterranean route tolusi holusi bechet is the person who found out this but understanding the fact that bechet's disease presents with these oral after sulcus understanding the fact that the most dreaded complication of bechet is thrombosis the answer to this question is actually speaking bechet 
and this is the photograph in that question where you can see recurrent non healing aphthous ulcers okay so basically this is a question which expects you to know the workup of thrombosis know all these causes of thrombosis that we have discussed but most importantly up and above this to know the vasculitic cause for thrombosis and the so called vasculitis cause for thrombosis is best did you understand my point? So, the question is of a slightly higher standard, but even if you don't know the theory, everything, if you can link this DVT to this non healing after ulcer, then you are easily set and done with the rest. Correct. So, again, a proper MRCP part one question, same question that they have asked. I have not given the options, just keep the discussion open ended. That is the reason why I have not given the options in the beginning. As and when we discuss more and more questions um, in the subsequent days to come, we will actually make, make give options also. Because if you give option and discuss from a teacher perspective, what happens is that the, the, the student gets distracted. No? They, they think of the option. But for the exam, original exam, you are having option. But by the time, you should come to a level whereby which you can integrate it with the option. That is a simple way. All right. Now, let us try to look a little deep into this. Why non-healing ulcers always you think of Bechet? So, let us just try to put this into shape. Bechet is a disease which during MBBS times we are taught as oclo-oral genital syndrome, correct? But I think all of you would be knowing by now that this is of no use knowing. Oro is it all what it, this is disease. The sinecure manifestation in the disease, the first feature is always oro. It is oro plus 2 out of 4 that is equal to Bechet. Two out of four, we will see, but what is mandatory is oral aphthe. So, always keep in mind recurrent painful oral aphthe. Recurrent painful oral aphthe, which means that you should be getting them, ideally speaking, three or more times inside a year. So, anybody with recurrent painful oral aphthe, anywhere on the tongue, okay, anywhere. If it starts as a uh, papule or a pustule, then it actually breaks into a shallow ulcer with a pseudomembranous necrotic base and surrounding erythema. That is how it is, and it heals without scarring. This we have discussed. Alongside with that, ocular manifestation, genital manifestation, pathology, there is one test called pathology testing and skin manifestations. These four things out of this, any two should be positive. Right? Then you can actually call it as Bechet. But the basic point is it always starts with recurrent non-heating ulcer. See, that is what the examiner is trying to check here. If you know that ocular oral genital syndrome is not what he is trying to check here. He is trying to check whether you know the cardinal manifestation is oral ulcers, oral aphthe, non-healing oral aphthe, which is also called canker source. Whether this you know, that means it starts off like this and that is when it actually progresses to other, other, other things. Correct? Ocular manifestations in Bechet. Remember, Bechet is that one disease that can cause acute anterior uveitis. That is the most common thing, but it can also produce posterior uveitis. It can produce retinal vasculitis. All these things can be seen. Okay, always keep it in mind. Just like sarcoid. Sarcoid and Bechet are the two diseases which can involve almost everywhere in the eye. But as for the exam, episcleritis and scleritis won't be seen. If you get episcleritis, scleritis, then you think of rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, other things, anything Bechet can be the answer. Genital ulcers, again, can be seen anywhere except the glans penis. You can see it anywhere and they are actually speaking more painful. Okay, they are more painful and they heal with scarring. So, more painful, heal with scarring. Correct. Then this pathology test is there, which we have discussed, and skin lesions are also there. Skin lesions can be of any type. Classically, what we see more often is erythema nodosum like kind of lesions. Okay, so these things are also very, very clear now. But is this disease just about this ocular or genital? No. That is the second most important message that the examiner wants to actually drive in. The disease is not just about this. That is one thing that he wants to drive in. Second thing he wants to drive in is that there is a real danger. And the danger is thrombosis. So, the most important danger is thrombosis. Yes, it is venous and arterial, but venous more than arterial. And CNS thrombosis, very, very notorious. And even CNS parenchyme involvement. Generally, for rheumatological condition to produce CNS parenchyme involvement and all is very, very uncommon. Even IgG4 and all, they produce packy meningitis kind of thing. CNS parenchyme involvement, very, very uncommon. Bechet is so, so classical with respect to that. Second, Bechet can mimic Crohn's. So, all the findings in Crohn's disease that you see, can be seen in Bechet also. Correct? And rarely cardiac involvement. So, that's not common to see cardiac involvement rarely. But the most important question for the exam is thrombosis and its association with Crohn's. That is because of this antibody, ASCA antibody, anti-saccharomyces cerevisiae antibody. Same antibody can be seen in Bechet, same antibody can be seen in Crohn's. Okay? And few very important catch points, pulmonary artery aneurysm. When you hear this word pulmonary artery aneurysm, Takayasu Bechet. Only two things to keep in mind. Okay? Never ever forget. Retinal vasculitis, again only two things to keep in mind. Sarcoid, Bechet. Brain parent came in involvement, again only one thing to keep in mind. Bechet. Sweet syndrome, again Bechet. Magic syndrome, again Bechet. Mouth and genital ulcers, 
with inflamed cartilage is called magic syndrome it has not been asked for the exam but like in case you get a question relapsing polychondritis is the inflamed cartilage that they're talking about plus mouth and genital ulcer that is beshet relapsing polychondritis with beshet is what we call as this magic syndrome okay so this question is just trying to test out your knowledge with respect to two things one whether you know how dvt is worked up because dvt is a very common condition everybody working in a medical college should be knowing how to test for dvt so that is a very simple understanding then whether they are able to link dvt to a cause that cause that they want you to link dvt to is, DVT to is Bechet's disease correct if you don't know this also you can think one way classification of ascleritis we have studied Bechet under variable vessel vasculitis because it involves vessels variably and inside that large vessels are involved and because large vessels are involved you can get what you can get thrombosis and that is manifesting as different different types of thrombosis okay so two things that the examiner wants to test out for here one side is the vasculitis part other side is the hematology part so this is trying to link both these together so more easier i think than the first two questions but again i'm telling you it is not something that we can become a champion overnight it is something that we slowly 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 learn so it is natural for us to not understand this in the beginning to slowly learn this is actually possible so just take it in its stride please understand that swimming can be never learned by reading the book if you read a book on swimming it looks so complicated right you have to i mean abduct the shoulder you have to extend the elbow you have to pronate supinate and all those things you have to do but if you do actually see somebody swim then you understand no? how elegantly he does that so that is what is the same thing here it's not practical to learn these things without going to the hospital to maximum proximity we are trying to do and to try and link it to everything possible so that is the how we are actually planned this out so hopefully you are getting into the groove with each subsequent discussion